looking at the agenda for this morning. So we're going to very straightforward agenda, welcome and introductions. Then we're going to look at the assessment objectives in detail, the style of question, the taxonomy used, and then finally, the support that's available from Pearson. Uh, for those of you that were here from module one a couple of weeks ago, you initially there's a little bit of overlap, but it's not a bad idea to revisit things anyway, but it is a very different presentation this morning. So the aims and objectives for the day are to understand the assessment objectives, understand the types of questions that your students will face, understand the mark scheme and how it's applied to answers, practice using the mark scheme, and then to learn about the support provided by Pearson around assessment and exam plans. So first of all, I'd like to get to know a bit about all of you. So into the chat box, can you type how long you've been teaching this specification, whether or not your students were entered for the last exam series, and what's the single most important thing you hope to take away from the session? I think we'll do it all in one go. So if you could type those three things into the chat box, that would be very helpful. So far, I'm getting people are new to this specification, teaching it for the first time. Um, any more responses from anybody? Yes, I can understand why the teaching resources are one of the most useful things to take away. I'll give a couple of minutes for people to type in and then we'll move on. So we have got at least some of you with some experience in teaching this qualification. We will move on, but you can continue to put things into the chat box.
So welcome to Pearson. Pearson Ed Excel. Um, it's the world's leading company and the UK's largest awarding organisation. So you're all obviously international, teaching international students and it's best place to provide the qualifications aligned to the British educational system. The heritage stretches back over 150 years and Pearson Ed Excel partners with schools, universities and employers worldwide offering world-class globally recognised qualifications. So we're going to start off by looking at the assessment objectives. There are three assessment objectives, AO1, AO2 and AO3. And the questions on the exam papers will focus on all three objectives with a prescribed percentage aligned to each of the different objectives. And it's very important that pupils are aware of how they will be assessed, not only the content that they need to learn, but how that content is assessed in the exam papers. Many pupils only focus on the content when they look at the specification they need to not only look at the content, but to look at the assessment objectives as well. They are, the assessment objectives are given in the specification. On the exam papers, there is a balance of each of the assessment objectives. AO1 and AO2 are the same between 38% and 42%. AO3 is between 19 and 21%. Now, <laughs> AO1 is the knowledge and understanding of biology. AO2 is the application of that knowledge and understanding and analysis and evaluation. So that is a higher cognitive demand. And then AO3 is where the experimental skills, analysis and evaluation of data and of me methodology in biology is examined. The balance of the assessment objectives is the same on paper one and paper two. In the previous specification, it was different, but it's, it is now the same. Can you type into the chat box which of the assessment objectives your students find the most challenging? a quick indication of which ones you think they find most challenging. And then we'll look at each of them in turn. Yes, we're getting a mix of AO2 and AO3. Very understandable. We'll move on and we will have a look at each of those assessment objectives. We'll start off with assessment objective one, AO1. And it's knowledge and understanding of the biology. The assessment objectives are the same across all of the three sciences. So whether you're teaching dual award science or whether you're teaching biology as a separate GCSE, the assessment objectives are the same. And it is knowledge and understanding of biology. Conscientious students tend to like assessment um, AO1 questions because they, they can work hard to feel confident in learning detail and depth. This is the assessment objective that requires straightforward revision. 
repetitions, mind maps, testing with flashcards, looking at lots of questions. So this is a typical AO1 question. Diagram of the eye and an instruction to name the label structures. So it's applying knowledge. And this is another assessment for AO1 question. Explain the ch changes that occur in the structures of the eye that allow light from distant object to be focused on the fovea. It is a longer question. Don't assume that AO1 questions are always going to be the shorter questions. They're not, but they are the questions that require learned knowledge, learned content. AO2 is the application of the knowledge and understanding and the analysis and evaluation of biology. The key idea of the application of knowledge, and it can often be in an unfamiliar context, may be a suggest question. This assessment objective may require a higher cognitive demand, such as evaluation and discussion. It may include calculations. We will come on to the maths aspect, but there are a certain number of marks have to be awarded for maths. And these will always be AO2 questions. May include graph plotting. The emphasis is on actually doing something. It can be more challenging for the less confident students. Your students, need to be aware that if they come across something that they think they haven't been taught, the chances are that it's require, requiring them to apply knowledge from a different context. So this is a typical AO2 question. Given a graph, they have to calculate the percentage increase in the rate of oxygen absorption at two different temperatures to compare them. Straightforward calculation. And then the second part of it is suggest why the rate of oxygen absorption is greater. That is also an AO2 question. It is asking them to take knowledge from one part of the syllabus and apply it to a different uh, situation. And the third assessment objective is looking at practical skills. There's no long, there's no practical exam. All the practice, all examination of practical skills and practicals if carried out is on the exam paper. So AO3 tests experimental skills, which can be core practicals. Sometimes a core practical question is AO1 if it's simply recall. But if it's putting a core practical into a slightly different situation, it is AO3. It can also include general practical themes, questions about variability or accuracy or reliability and evaluating of practical methods and data. This assessment objective often requires higher cognitive sk skills and uses command words such as evaluate and discuss or make a judgment. So we will have a look at some typical AO3 questions. This 
Now, this question gives an experimental situation. It asks students to explain how they could use this apparatus to show that carbon dioxide is needed for photosynthesis. The first part, because it's explained, is AO2. But the second part, which asks students why it's a good idea to cut the leaf into small shapes for testing, is AO3 because it is looking at the idea of reliability. You can repeat it with similar patterns. So we're going to have a look at a couple of questions. Can Somebody says they can't hear me. If you give me one minute, I'll put my headphones on in case that improves it. I can um I can hear you fine though. You can hear me okay. Yeah. Right. I'll just contact I'll contact her and just maybe she might need to reset or something. Right. Somebody else says they can hear me. Maybe it's my accent. Right, I was a request to explain it again. So you've got an experimental situation. I can also hear you fine. It's a practical that you will most likely have done. So it says explain how this apparatus can be used to show that carbon dioxide is needed for photosynthesis. Straightforward application of what you've done. So that is, I've lost myself. That is AO2. And then the bottom part, when you're suggesting why it's a good idea, that is looking at reliability. So it's an experimental method. So that is A03. So we're going to now, the other aspect of A03 is planning. So this is a typical A03 planning question. which we will look at in more detail later. They're given some information. They have to design an investigation to determine the temperature at which plant material is broken down most effectively. It is asking them to take information and practicals that they have done and give all the experimental details to design, to, to carry out that investigation. And this is a six mark question. And there will be six mark planning questions on the exam paper. So we're going to look at a couple of questions and I want you to type into the chat box what which assessment objective you think they are. So if you could type into the chat box which assessment objective you think this question is.
couple more ideas of which assessment you think it is, please. Most of you have identified this correctly as being assessment objective one. Describe the role of the stomach. It is using the content that you have learned about the role of the stomach in the digestive system. It's got three marks. It's a relatively straightforward question or a question that you, you can learn the answer to. Now this is three parts of a question. Can you read it through and again, type into the chat box, which of the assessment objectives you think each of the question parts uh, assessing. We're getting a bit of variation here. I will give a few more minutes for more of you to put in your thoughts on this and then we'll talk about it in a bit more detail.
a few more ideas on this. And we'll have a look at them. So the question is about pollution reducing the growth of shoots by affecting cell division. First part of the question, name the type of cell division affected by pollution. So it's asking them to name the type of cell division involved in the growth of shoots. The fact that it's linked to the investigation, that, that the type of cell division involved in the growth of shoots is mitosis. It is a factual answer. So that is assessment objective one. It, they need to be able to pick out the things that are just requiring, requiring them to recall information, even though it is put into a particular context. Then it moves on to talk about how the investigation is carried out. And it asks about control of variables. First of all, abiotic variables, and then later on, biotic variables. So if you're talking about control of variables, you're then talking about experimental methodology. It says discuss, there's four marks, so there's two for each part. So it will be asking them to say why those variables need to be controlled. But both of these parts of the question are about experimental design and planning. So they are both A03. Many questions will be set out in this way so that they, they are examining more than one assessment objective. But it may well, as in this case, be first part is one assessment objective, the second two parts are both the same assessment objective. If it's to do with planning investigations, it will be A03. Then this question is about corn being affected by fungus. Explain how this fungus feeds on the corn. So it again, it's a slightly different so now it's scenario, but it is how does fungus feed? So can you type in which assessment objective you think that is, please?
One of the statements <clears throat> in topic one is for students to understand how a fungus feeds. So therefore, this is predominantly AO1. Possibly bringing in a little bit of AO2 because it is putting it into a different situation. But this would be on the assessment grid as an A01 question. Right. And this is looking at a difference in energy transfer. Information is given and it's ask, they're asking to explain the difference in energy transfer. Can you again type into the chat box which assessment objective you think this is? Yes, you are correctly identifying this as an AO2 question. It is application of knowledge into a different context. Now we want to move on to how we can help students identify the assessment objectives that they need to develop. They as they're going through the course, they need to not only be aware of the areas where they need to revise content, but also how to apply that content to the different assessment objectives. Exam Wizard is a very useful resource to enable you to set tests. It use, it's a bank of past questions, but it can be used to set a test that focuses either on a particular topic or on a particular assessment objective. This is a free to use resource from Pearson that is very, very useful. You can then generate grids to go with the tests so that they can fill them in as they go through and identify the areas where they need further work. Results plus, is a resource that's available um, to look at exam results and identify areas for development. And Pearson also allow access to scripts after exams so that candidates and teachers can have a look at the areas where they particularly struggled. 
Exam Wizard is a free to use resource. You can access it when you are signed up to deliver Pearson qualifications. And you can use it to test a particular assess assessment objective or a particular topic. And when you use Exam Wizard to set a test for your students, the mark schemes will also be automatically generated, which means that the mark schemes you use are the ones that were used when the um, question was used in the exam and the examiner, examiner reports that went with those that the questions will also be generated. This is an example of a test grid that students can use. So they do their test, it's marked and then they get it back and they fill in their score for each question or part question. It gives them the maximum mark they could get and it also tells them which assessment objective it is. So at the end, they can tally up their total score, the scores that they got for AO1 and AO2 and AO3. So used on an ongoing basis, it helps identify areas that need extra attention. We now want to look at how we develop the skills for each assessment objective. And if we start with AO1, this is factual recall skills. So factual knowledge tests, revision notes, mind maps, lists, uh, blank page revision, standard methods for learning content. Students teaching each other, that can apply to all the assessment objectives really, and that's a very good way to learn. Always use key vocabulary. We'll see an example of this later, but students are expected to use the correct vocabulary, such as photosynthesis, digestion, emulsification, hydrolysis. And if they use it all the time, they will become more confident with it as they go through the course. Uh, it's a good idea to make a list of key vocabulary at the start of each topic and then keep referring back to them. When teaching complex concepts, build up a picture gradually rather than doing everything in one go. AO2 is it's um it's not just apply, it's not just repeating what they know, it has to be applied. A lot of AO2 questions use data. So to develop AO2 skills, if you give students regular data analysis questions, uh, encourage them to think about different contexts that their knowledge can be applied to. Um, develop graph skills, numerical skills and analytical skills right from the start of year seven. Um, using them as a matter of course as to how you would analyze results from an experiment. Building up their confidence will help their performance. If they're asked to evaluate something, encourage them to see both sides of the argument. Look for, look for data that supports and data that does not support, not just start off with a preconceived idea and then look for the data that supports that idea. Um, when they're writing up practicals, the conclusions are the part they find most difficult. If you, give, if you scaffold it to start off with, give them an idea of what they should be writing in their conclusions. And then gradually, as time goes on and they become more confident, reduce the scaffolding. And data exercises can be used as a quick starter activity or they can be used as a homework activity. And they can be differentiated for different ability groups. 
by breaking it down. So if we look at this as an example of how to differentiate data analysis, we've got a table of results. Undifferentiated, a straightforward, open question, discuss the rates of oxygen use by different species of shrew. If you feel your student, if your students are younger or you feel that they will struggle with that, you can give them a series of questions to answer that will result in them discussing the rates of oxygen use. And again, as pupils become more confident, then you will reduce the amount of scaffolding they're given. AO3 is all about practical work. The best way to develop the skill for, skills for AO3 is to do lots of practical work. Not only the core practicals, but other practicals that you are familiar with. Um, a significant proportion of the marks is about practical skills and understanding rather than specific practicals. But this needs teaching as much as factual content. Pupils again can begin to plan practicals early on and become familiar with key vocabulary. Accurate, variable, repeatability are things that they should be revisiting all the way through their secondary education. Collate class data. That gives them lots of data to look at so that you can look at the accuracy and the quality of the data. Um, maths questions will often be on practical data. Don't assume that they will bring the maths skills from their maths lessons and encourage them to believe they can do maths questions. They all can, but they tend to look at them and think, I can't do this. Some practicals you might find difficult to actually carry out. Students can still plan them or analyze data from that type of practical. Again, when students are younger or for weaker students, you give lots of guidance. Things to fill in, the independent variable, two control vari controlled variables, um, you can give them a hypothesis as a gap to fill in. Lots of clues as they are starting to plan practicals to make sure they do them correctly so that as time goes by, they will do it automatically themselves. So you can gradually reduce the scaffolding. And if they progress through the years, by the time they reach A level, then they'll know how to plan, carry out and analyze a practical. We're now going to come on to look at question styles, the styles of question that they will be given. Every paper will have a variety of types of questions and the types of questions will be across the assessment objectives. So there are a number of multiple choice questions. We'll come on to the numbers later. But don't assume the multiple choice questions are easy. They are not. And they can address each of the assessment objectives. There'll be a number of short answer questions, one, two, or three marks, which will typically be describe, suggest, or explain. There will be a certain number of longer answer questions, mini, mini essays, which can be four, five or six marks. 
Again, they can be across the assessment objectives. So they maybe describe, they maybe explain, evaluate, discuss, or plan for an experimental question. There will be questions that involve experimental planning, um, and we'll come on to the use of CORMS later. And there will be a percentage of mass questions as well. Paper two has a comprehension which sets the scene for synoptic questions which test across the topics. And we'll look at one of those later. So paper one has up to 10 multiple choice questions. Paper two has up to five. Uh, pure recall can only, the maximum number of marks for pure recall is only about 15%. And obviously not, that will be in other questions as well as the multiple choice. So some multiple choice questions will be more demanding. <laughs> If you have a look at these two multiple choice questions, both based on a food chain, which of these organisms is a secondary consumer and which will be hunted more often by predators? Both of these are AO2 questions. They are, they won't have seen that food web food chain before. It is applying knowledge to a different situation. Short answer questions. Two marks describe the role of enzymes in genetic modification. Straightforward question, AO1, they should have learned the role of enzymes in modification, in genetic modification. A longer question, five marks. A balanced diet should include the correct proportions of each component. Two of these components are vitamins and minerals. Describe the function of the other components of a balanced diet. Some of the longer answer questions have higher cognitive requirements. They are, uh, may use words such as discuss or evaluate. Mark schemes are point-based, they're not level-based. Uh, candidates should look at the allocation of marks rather than number of lines. They should have more than enough lines that they need to answer the question. Um, they should focus on using precise, accurate language Longer answers are, uh, even in the longer answers questions, bullet points are acceptable. Um, and spelling, phonetic spelling isn't penalized as long as the word can't be mistaken for another biological term. So photosynthesis with an F is okay, but meiosis and mitosis both need to be spelled correctly because otherwise they could it may be not clear whether they, which one they are using. Now in your pack you have got two questions to answer. It goes it's the question on lost it now. It's a question about this question. Balanced diet should correct, contain the correct proportions of each component. So that is the question. Describe the functions of the other components of a balanced diet. Other is in bold to help bring attention to that. This is the mark scheme for that question. Where words are underlined, it doesn't mean that they are more important, but it means that 
an alternative, that term, that correct term has to be used. Or there are no alternatives. And you will get, in a mark scheme, you'll get additional guidance for what will be allowed and what will not be allowed. So you have got two answers in your pack. If you could mark those two answers using this mark scheme and then put your answers into the chat box, please. Right, and you start to put your answers into the chat box. We've got any answers in the chat box yet for the, how many marks you would give these two questions?
a few more marks in for what you would give this. This, you need to be looking in your delegate booklet for this answer, for the two answers to the question. So far, I've only got two people who've marked, marked one of them, I think. If you could put two marks in, A and B, for what you would give this answer, that would be very helpful. Got any more marks for these questions? A couple more minutes and then we'll go on to talk about it. But it is helpful to you if you practice applying these mark schemes so that you can help your students. Right, these are the answers that are given. I'm hoping you've all found them in your resource pack by now. But we will go through and talk about them in a second. Right, it doesn't look like I'm going to get any more in the chat box. Right, we've got two answers to the question. The question asks them to describe the function. So each mark point, if you have a look at the mark scheme you've got, the, the named nutrient is linked to its function. It's not enough just to give a list. You need to say what its role is. 
those of you who have marked it have been quite generous. Mark the A get only gets one mark. It says that carbohydrates, protein, water, and fiber are needed, but it doesn't say what they're needed for. They need lipids for energy. That's where the mark is. It then goes to talk, on to talk about the role of a number of vitamins and minerals, but the question specifically says the role of the things you need in your diet other than vitamins and minerals. And the other is in bold to guide students in the right direction. So this answer gets one mark for plenty of lipids for energy. Answer B gains two marks. It gains a mark for saying fats are important for energy and a mark for saying proteins and amino acids are used for growth and repair. Starch is not enough for, for carbohydrates. There's a number of carbohydrates. Carbohydrates is underlined in the mark scheme. So you know that there isn't any other alternative. And again, fresh fruit and vegetables is not enough for roughage. It's, it's not showing that they know what the fresh role of the fresh fruit and vegetables is. We're now going to have a look at experimental planning. And it is worth <coughs> using the acronym CORMS to help your students with their planning. Change, organism, repeats, measurements, same. The planning questions are AO3. There's usually one experimental planning question on paper one, and it will be worth six marks. It will be an unfamiliar context. It will be using experimental skills they have to plan a valid experiment in an unfamiliar context, not focused on core practicals. When planning, it's, it will help your students to use COMS, but the plan must be written in an experimental context. They can use bullet points, but not just COMS with each, um, each part of it identified. So, It is worth making sure your students are aware of these. Two marks are usually given for the measure, the M, and two marks are usually given for the S, what you're going to keep the same. Measure needs to be to say exactly what you're going to measure. Mass, length, units, not just amount. The second mark, uh, measure mark point is often given for time. It needs to be a stated time. There is some leniency because the students might not know exactly how long something will take, but just the same time is not sufficient. It needs to be stated. And again, clarification of what COMS is. It can be very useful when students are learning to are starting to plan that they list them at the top just to remind them to include them all. So we're going to look at the question <coughs> investigating plant growth substances. Describe an investigation to find the best concentration of plant growth substance. Although the command word is described, this is definitely an AO3 question because it is taking information and practicals they have done and applying it to a new context. 
so the mark scheme gives the things that they need to include different concentrations of growth substances um, the same species or the same plant or type of plant there's one mark for saying repeat although we do like that to be clarified repeat at each concentration um, stated time period of one day plus they do not necessarily know how long it will take but they, know, they should know that plants are not going to grow roots in less than a day and again it's count the number of roots or the length of roots or measure with a ruler you can't measure the mass of the roots in a growing plant so ignore that don't they don't lose a mark for it but they don't get credit and again what you keep in the same temperature, oxygen, light, so an abiotic variable and then a biotic variable. Ignore nutrients. It needs to be mineral ions or a named mineral ion. Now you have got two, again, you've got two, but you've got three answers in your pack. Um, you should be able to see those. So if you could mark those and then put the put what the marks you would give them into a chat into the chat box, and then we will talk about them. I'll leave the mark scheme up to help you, and then if you use your resource pack to actually look at the answers that were given. Right, before we talk about them, if you can put some answers in the chat, some marks in the chat box, and then we will go through and talk about it. Can we have a few marks in the chat box, please? Hi, Jill. Hello. Sorry to interrupt you. I just saw um, somebody was making a comment just asking to kindly show the student's answer because only the mark scheme is visible. So right. I, I, can, I can move it on to the student answers, and I will do in a minute. But oh, they okay. Should, sorry. Sorry. Well, I was interrupting. They should have, in, in the resource pack, gives the mark scheme and the student answers. 
if I move it on to the answers, I'll take it away from the mark scheme because they should have that in their pack in front of them. Ah, uh, okay, no problem. But I will move it on and talk about it because and it, um, otherwise I'll get behind. No, um, no, that's fine. Sorry for interrupting. Uh, no, uh, no, but they don't. I think some of them have not either not downloaded the book or not because I'm not getting as many marks put into the chat box as I would expect. Okay. Just a reminder, if anybody does need to be sent um, uh, the booklet, I can send it out to you. So just type your email address or private message to me, Philip Stonia, your email address, and I'll send it over to you now. A few people have done it already. So just a reminder, just send me your email address and I'll send it over to you now. Thank you. So this is the question. It would actually be helpful if they were on the same page, wouldn't it? But you know, this is the question. Describe the best concentration of plant growth substance to stimulate root growth. That's what we're asking the students to do. That's the mark scheme. You should have the three answers to look at in your resource pack, but we will move on and look at them anyway. Uh, I see a lot of you are putting your email addresses in to get the resource pack. We will move on and look at the answers, but it will be worth you going back through them with the mark scheme later. So this is the first answer. This answer would gain three marks it says several oat seedlings it names a species so that is the O mark a range of different oxen concentrations so that is the C mark Repeat each concentration with three plants. That's a very good explanation of repeat because it explains exactly what they're doing. It doesn't say how they're going to measure growth, just to see how much they grow so they don't get a measure mark. And they don't get the S mark because the same amount of nutrients in the soil is not the same as minerals. And this is a general rule that is applied all the way through in biology papers. It needs to be min minerals in the soil and not nutrients. And keeping everything the same is too vague. They need to say what they're going to keep the same. Give you a couple of minutes to glance through this if you haven't got it. Right, we're not looking for the assessment objective, we're looking for the actual number of marks. And this is a very good answer that gains all the marks. A range of oxygen concentrations. That's the C mark. Plants of the same species, that's the O mark, place different concentrations of auxins on the root of each one. Repeat this two more times so there are three for each concentration. Again, a very good explanation of repeats. That's the R mark. <laughs> <coughs> 
measure the length of the roots and then measure one week later to see how much they have grown. So you, you measuring the length of the roots for the first M mark, you've got a stated time of one week later for the second M mark. You've got same mineral iron concentration in the soil and the same oxygen and carbon dioxide concentration. So that is a very good answer with all the marks. The third answer, we've got two plants of the same species. And we've got repeat at the end. So that gets two marks. It, it, the question specifically asks about a range of hormone concentrations. It's only got one with and one without. So this doesn't get the change mark, and that is in the additional guidance in the on the mark scheme. It specifically says oxen and no oxen doesn't gain a mark. It says what the plant hormones do, but this is not answering the question. It's not describing the experimental planning. So that is two marks. If we come on to plot, plotting graphs, again, another acronym, where you, when, when you are showing students about, growing, about drawing graphs, it is a good idea to, again, you have this acronym, they need a scale, the lines need to be between the points and neat. The axis needs to be the correct way around. The axes need to be labelled. The points plotted correctly. Units correct on each axis. And if you've got more than one line or bar, you need a key. The line shouldn't be extrapolated past the data series. You do not know what's going to happen past the data that you're given. And scale should be linear and have sensible increments and regular increments. So this is a typical maths question. 10% of the marks on the paper will be from uh, will be from calculations. This can include graph plotting. And the graphs are typically bar charts or points joined with straight lines. The question will tell you which type of graph it is. Lines of best fit are not unless it specifically says, and not what are required. The, the points need to be joined. So this typical maths question, calculate the percentage increase in the predicted number of deaths. A lot of the maths questions will be things like percentages, ratios, probabilities, and a graph plotting question. So this would be a typical graph plotting question. Regular series of data, number of bubbles, one box with no data. You do not know what happens when the temperature is 50. Plot a graph to show these results. Join the points with straight lines. So it's telling you that it is a line graph, not a bar chart. This is how it will be marked. So there's one mark for the scale being linear and using at least half the axes, so it's not squashing one corner. The lines are straight and go through each point. The axes are the correct way around. 
they're labelled temperature in degrees C and bubbles per minute. You need the units as well. It's underlined to show you need the whole thing and the points are plotted accurately. You, the points mark will not be awarded if data is plotted for 50 degrees because there was no data in the table for that. This is a typical answer, typical. And this is a very a nice clear graph which would gain five marks. And they've covered all the points. Now, paper two starts with the comprehension question. It's stimulus material to set the scene. The questions linked to the comprehension question will often be synoptic and draw from several areas of the specification. Candidates should be encouraged to make sure they read the information at the start of the question because it sets the scene and it also, some of the answers will need referring back to this. So, this is a typical comprehensive comprehension question. Information that the students will not be have come across before. It's not something that you should have taught them or that they should know. There will be words in there that they should know the meaning of. They don't need to, they're not expected to know what dinoflagellates are. They are expected to know what, pro, what protoctists are and various points like that. It will be quite a long piece of information. It carries on into A-level if your students do A-level where one of the papers has the pre-released article. Half of the axis means that they, some students will tend to squash their graph into the little left-hand corner of the graph paper. Their scale should cover at least half of the axis. I hope that helped. So we've got the comprehension and then we've got a range of questions. Some will be straight recall of what they know. Some will link directly back. So the information comes from the comprehension. A lot of them will be applying what they know to the context. So that's just an example of the comprehension type question. We're now going to come on to think on come on to think about the command words that are used. Command words are very important because they will guide the students into how they should be answering the questions. Every question will have a command word and they have specific meanings. It tells them what to write they need to know what the command word means. <clears throat> Describe and explain are, require a different type of answer. Describe is just recalling the knowledge. Explain should be able to have a because or a therefore in the sentence. The taxonomy used is common across international GCSE sciences. Uh, they're found in, append in an appendix at the back of a specification and you will get a 
range of command words used across the demand range of the exam paper. So the command words are in the specification. They are used in the sample assessment material and also in past exam papers. And past papers, if you look at the mark schemes to go with the questions, it will give examples of how answers should be written for each command word. So that is the list that you will find in the specification. The most frequently used words are discuss, describe, sorry, not, yes, sorry, I'll start that again. The most frequently used words are describe, explain, evaluate, discuss, suggest, and comment on. And they have different cognitive demands. So the most strict, the demand increases. The least demand is state, describe, and it goes through to evaluate and discuss being the most demanding command words. Students particularly confuse describe and command. This question, uh, describe and explain. This answer asks to explain the difference in the rate of transpiration. Just, recur, just, just describing the pattern in the data will not get the marks because it's asking to explain. You should be able to say because or therefore. If you get if you just describe the data, then you won't get any credit. Students will not get any credit for their answers. So you've got table of results and it says explain the difference in the rate of transpiration in wind and still air. Comment on is that halfway down the demand arrow. Got two sets of data, uh, two sets of data, the dissolved oxygen and the oxygen used at a range of different temperatures. The scientist concludes that hot water pollution affects the population of fish. Comment on this conclusion. Comment on requires the description of several data trends and statements as to what the data shows. So you've got, as the temperature increases, the oxygen decreases and the oxygen used by the fish increases. So it's a five mark question. The question is about the effect on the fish. So you would expect the fish population to reduce because there's increase in oxygen concentration. However, there's less available oxygen. One mark is, first mark is the state of what you think would happen. Second two marks come directly from the data and then why this would have an effect. Respiration is affected, bacteria may grow in the water, the fish will die or migrate. But you're commenting on it, so you're then giving both sides. <coughs> There's only one fish used, so the results are not reliable. Command word suggests. 
use their own knowledge to a solution to propose a solution to a problem in a novel context. Suggest how wood lice benefit from the bacteria in their digestive system. Suggest how bacteria benefit from living in the good gut of wood lice. This would follow on from information about wood lice having bacteria in their digestive system. So we then come on to evaluate. The, reviewing the information and bringing it together to form a conclusion. Come to a supported judgment of a subject. So. <clears throat> Evaluate whether the bell jar model can completely demonstrate the process of ventilation. So you've got a bell jar standard experiment. You are, the students are being asked to say how well it demonstrates the process of ventilation. So it's evaluate, it will need the pros and cons. and make a valid judgment. So the mark scheme is four marks. It, require, it needs reference to the diaphragm, the fact that the balloons represent the lungs, reference to the trachea or windpipe or bronchus, reference to the rib, the ribs, the rib cage, but the bell jar doesn't move, so it doesn't represent these well. And reference to the intercostal muscles, which obviously are not there in the bell jar. There are four marks. As you may well have noticed, there are quite often more marking points than there are marks available. If students who write four of those marking points will get four marks. We're going to come on in a few minutes, have a look at some answers. But we're going to think, first of all, about the command word discuss, which requires students to explore all aspects of an issue or a situation or a problem. And there's some data on the effect of genetic modification on the growth of SAMP. The students measured the mass and length of one normal salmon and one genetically modified salmon when they're both 18 months old. It shows the mass and the length of normal and genetically modified salmon. The student concludes that his results show that genetically modified salmon are useful in providing a balanced diet. Discuss the student's results. And the mark scheme. Again, there's eight marking points, so they don't have to, they only have to have six of them. It's a longer answer. Um, From the data, they grow more, they're heavier, larger, longer. One mark on for taking it from the data. Therefore, more protein is provided. But then a comment that you only need sufficient protein. A balanced diet also needs vitamins, carbohydrates, a named component. A comment on the experiment only one salmon used, so the data is not reliable. No information on the food supply and the protein needs of a person depend on age, sex or activity. I think this will follow on from more data earlier on in the question about protein in salmon.
But this is the mark scheme to go with the discuss question. Now, if you have a look in your, if you go back to the resource pack, Go back to the resource pack, there are scripts for you to mark, going back to this question about mineral ions. <clears throat> they're not absorbed, they're ingested in the faeces. The faeces of genetically modified farm animals contain less phosphate than the faeces of normal farm animals. Discuss why people who catch fish near the land might support the genetic modification of farm animals. And there's the mark scheme. And in your resource pack, you have got two answers to this question. So if you could have a look at them and put the answers into the marks you would award into the chat box. If you can't see the questions, can you please just type into the tap chat box so I know how many people can't actually see the questions? Right, so I'm assuming you can all see them. So if you could put into the chat box the marks that you would give to the two questions, that would be very helpful. I can show you the answers, but unfortunately, I can't show you the mark scheme at the same time. This answer gains four marks. It gains one mark for less eutrophication, first mark. The spelling is, there's no way that that can be anything else, although it's spelled incorrectly, that is fine. It gets mark point three. Or less decomposition or less decomposers. Less oxygen is a further mark. Less respiration. Oh, no, the de decomposed bacteria would respire, so more respiration in the bacteria. And then the fish would die. So this is a good answer that gains four marks. Like this gets one mark at the beginning for saying less algae. And it gets just about gets one mark at the end for saying the fish would die because it says the algae poison the fish. <clears throat> the information in between that is confused. Um, Phosphate is not directly poisonous and doesn't bioaccumulate. 
It certainly isn't linked to acid rain and global warming. It is important that candidates are clear about the different pollutants that they learn about and the effects of each one. It, then it's quite common for students to confuse the different pollutants and this loses the marks. If we come back to the bell jar model, and you have seen the marks being before, there are two answers in your pack. This is the first of them. If you could quickly type, I'll give you a few minutes to type in what marks you would give it, but I appreciate that you can't see if you've not got the resources, you can't see the mark scheme and the answer. Right, this mark gets, this answer will only gain one mark at the end for saying the balloons are like the lungs. The, the question is about ventilation, it's not about gas exchange, so the comment about the alveoli isn't relevant. Chest muscles is not sufficient for intercostal muscles, and bronchioles is not the same as bronchi. The gas tubes are like the bronchioles, they're not like the divided bronchi, so it only gains one mark at the end for the balloons are like the lungs. You need to encourage your students to be accurate in their answers and to refer back to the question. This answer is a much better answer. It's evaluated. It's given both sides, it gets four marks. Bullet points are quite acceptable. So it's got the balloons are like lungs because they can change size. It has a trachea that splits into bronchi. It's got the diaphragm. But then it goes on to say the, the glass jar won't move, there are no ribs no intercostal muscles, and then he makes a comment that it's a good model. So this gets four marks. We're going to finish off with looking at the support that is available from Pearson to help you with teaching this specification. There's a lot of free support available on the website. a list of all the support that is available for planning, teaching and learning, exam preparation and support when the results come out. You can access course materials on the website when you're signed up to teach, teach this specification. Uh, you get the specification, you get sample examples, sample exam questions, um, past papers, mark schemes. There's also teaching and learning materials with lesson plans, course planner, and much more. And the bank of materials is being continually added to. These are all free resources. Um, Maths for, for scientists, core practical guide, practical terminology, and then guides for each of the topics. Results Plus is a very useful tool to analysis, to analyze students' performance. 
you can get in-depth data from exam results. You can also use it with your mock exam results. So if you put mock exam results into Results Plus, you'll get direct analysis of their results, which you can then use to inform revision, both for individual students and from your teaching point of view. And it gives students access to their final grades and performance breakdown. Schools have to sign up, but it's a very easy step to sign up for Results Plus. It's a free online service. When students take the exam, the exam papers are all scanned in to onto a website, a website, a resource. And examiners mark the papers online, which means that all the marks can be um, accumulated into different ways and performance reports can be shared. Exam Wizard is another free tool, which we touched on earlier. It can be used to give quick homework assignments, topic tests, mock exams, and the, it will automatically tag questions against the unit that they're from, the topic and the assessment objective, or you can use a whole past paper. It gives the mark schemes that we used to mark those <clears throat> when the exams were set, which makes the marking very accurate. There's also an examiner report re produced after each exam, which gives further insight into how the marks were awarded, what sort of things students did well and didn't do so well. And the more recent exam content is available sooner. And the results from tests used in exam wizard can be used to see where more support is needed and inform teaching strategies. It is a very useful resource. Students after the exam also have access to their scripts. It's the free online portal which allows immediate access. It's self-service, it's online, it's free, and it is instant from results day onwards. It helps target EARs rather than cutting down, rather than speculative EARs. They have the time and information needed to make informed decisions. Inquiry after results are EARs. You can see all students marked exam papers free of charge. There is no comments from the examiners on the papers that you will see the marks awarded are there, but no comments from examiners. And it gives you, you can use it to alongside Results Plus to give you a detailed breakdown of students' performance. And it will help you going forward to identify topics and skills that perhaps need a little bit more attention. In addition to the free resources, there are paid resources available. There's a curriculum matched student books with active books that give them further access online. And there are teaching hubs for teachers. The student books cover the international GCSE from grade nine to grade one. The teaching hubs are new and they provide fully comprehensive planning and front of class guidance, exam preparation resources and CPD support, whether you're a specialist or a non-specialist teacher. It enables you to spend less time planning. Schemes of work that break the international GCSE specifications into hour long sessions, detailed lesson plans, with time allocations to suit different lesson lengths, as well as in-depth teacher guidance. It enables you to deliver great lessons with a wealth of front of class resources linked to the lesson plans, interactive exercises, animations and videos. 
The lesson plans are partly scripted with instructions for communicating new learning plan points and correcting misconceptions and interactive exam preparation resources. I think that brings us to the end of the presentation. Your dedicated subject advisor is always happy to answer questions and queries, and you can easily get contact her. And if you can't get hold of her immediately, she will always get back to you.